Yes, I'd like to thank once more the speakers for their inspiring insights and the very diplomatic transmission of all this depressing news <laughs> uh, on a lot of initiatives, uh, I think including on ours. We definitely learned a lot on, on our part. Um, and also for concluding with uh, positive outcomes. So I invite all the speakers and Lena now to move over to the round table for uh, the questions um, on the practical toolbox that we can apply. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Karim, for reminding me that um, we actually welcome also questions in French, uh, especially in this session, because we know that this uh, concerns the toolbox, and so this is not necessarily academic stuff that are used to speaking in English. So please uh, feel free to speak up also in French if this makes uh, your contribution easier. Um, I'd like to first pick Lena's brain on her experience, uh, because you have organized so many events in Europa Nova on the Quai d'Orsay. Are there any lessons that you learned on organizing such events? Yes, indeed, and I, please let me uh, just stand up for, for, the, for this one. Um, in light. Okay, thank you. Spotlight. <laughs> yeah, so um, Christiana and I have known each other for a couple of years now and shared a lot of experience. And once she told me, Lena, you should definitely come and, and tell one of those stories. And I said, okay, with pleasure. And I'm really honored to be here. Um, so the story I would start with is, um, so in the first week of my new job as Director General of Europa Nova back in 2016, I was asked to organize a conference and we barely had one week to do so. So it was really, really uh, stressful and fast. And um, we did manage to you know, pull, up, pull together the gig and fill in uh, the whole auditorium of uh, Ecole des Mines with uh, Euro Europe enthusiasts. However, um, after the event, looking at the pictures of the event, I, at only this moment, I realized that the six-person panel I gathered myself was all male. And I, I really have to be honest with you, I really discovered this fact only when I was after the event, when I was looking at the pictures. And it was the same thing um, with, with my board of administrators of Europa Nova. They also had the same revelation. Well, agreed, we had only one week to organize, but this is very symptomatic of uh, something that I also realized later in my career as um, event organizer in public and private sector and also in, um, in academia. But uh, fast forward to my more recent experience at uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France, where um, I contributed to organize an event uh, to show um, to a group of people what um, French diplomacy looks like. And it, uh, for the first draft of the panel, um, the um, French diplomacy would have looked like an old gentleman's club. And I really had to point this out to my colleagues and say, guys, really? Do you really want this to be the image of the, uh, of the French diplomacy? And they sincerely, and I believe them, didn't think of uh, including women. But once they were pointed this fact out, they found amazing profiles. I mean, not that found, they thought of amazing profiles who were who are um, very inspiring role models. And we have been talking about this uh, very important uh, part of the, um, of the inclusion. So with this, with this in mind, um, we have talked about, as Kaiser, it was you saying that, and also Piet uh, talked about it, adding member numbers is not enough. We need to make people feel included. That was you, Kaiser. But my question would be, how actually do you get to this first step of having women in the, uh, in the, in the ground, on the ground, on the field, before they can actually even have a chance to feel included? And how do you, how do you nudge that? I think it's a question to all three of you. So, please. Um, okay, if I had that slide, it would be easier for me because they're all there, but uh, it's okay. We'll put it later. So I think there are, um, I mean, as we saw throughout the day, I think that um, 
the solutions are basically all over and in, all, in small tweaks in every single step of all the processes, starting with basically almost with birth. But um, in terms of, if, if we go directly to the, to the workplace, I think that it's really important to, um, uh, to make a statement and to make it clear that f for all the reasons that, you, that you've put forward, whether it's, whether it's just basic moral reasons, economic reasons, any reason, to make it clear that you want, to, that this is your intention. Your intention is to increase diversity and to appoint diversity teams that, that have the specific goal of working on this topic and that also have the data. And so this is something that I didn't have the time to discuss during my talk, but one thing which radically changed, I mean, not, maybe not radically, but progressively changed in the past, um, maybe six, seven years for, since I joined my team, is that there is more and more data collection to actually see the numbers and see what progress we want to make. Because we, if we don't have that data structure, then we don't know what the situation is. We don't know where we want to prog where, where we want to wh wh what we want to reach. Uh, and so I think that um, there are a lot of small things you need to do at the beginning to uh, make the intention clear, to make the problem clear, and then to um, to in, um, integrate in reform specific targets that you want to reach. And this has been done a lot in France in several administrations where you have uh, specific targets that have been set and there's monitoring and evaluation to see to what extent we've reached them or not. Uh, I don't want to take the monologue, so I'm going to have other answers, but I'll just let you maybe complete. Sure. So. Uh, to sort of get back on the quota issue, so Pierre showed us some evidence that says that you know changing the quota in the composition of the hiring committee doesn't do much. But there is research that shows that make, sort of constituting a quota among the pool of applicants actually works. But here the trick is that there's research that shows that if the quota is a quota of one, that means a token female applicant. So we say that, okay, we're going to have four finalists and you have to have one woman. It actually doesn't do anything because then we know that she is the token candidate and we have sort of fulfilled the requirement and ticked the box and uh, her chances of being hired are actually less than 25%. So if, you know, it's not one of four. But there's also re research that shows that if you say that the quota is 50%, so if you have four applicants and you say that the requirement is that it's two women, two men, then the chances are equal. So this is sort of goes back to your point is that, you know, we have to be very smart, you know, if we're setting some metrics and measures, like what are those? And we should test them beforehand. So, so this quota thing we, has been tested. So tokenism hurts, um, but setting up um, sort of equal uh, pools um, seem to work. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, the, the one thing I'd like to say is, um, so, I mean, in my paper, we kind of see that there is gender bias in hiring, right? But what was really striking for me in those kind of arrogant figures is that um, when you look at the percentage of PhDs to assistant professors, there there's a small gap, right? The proportions of men increase, but it's really small. And where all the action is, is when we get to four professors. Some of that is because all the cohorts, uh, there was probably a lot more discrimination uh, than there is now, but I really think uh, most of the action then, we have to think uh, about workplace culture, how do we make academia more inclusive, and maybe um, there's not that much to be gained from messing around with the hiring processes, but that's kind of my hunch on that. Thank you for the insights. I would like now to also introduce Max Chomon, who will be uh, taking the questions on the Zoom, um, the, the Zoom attendees. Do we have a first question that you want to address? There was actually one comment uh, by uh, Min Jung Kim, which I must admit I kind of freely interpreted towards the end. Uh, most of the current structures in academia and industry have been built by males and optimized by their traits. Um, failure of the recent shift and efforts to include females into this uh, solidified framework should not come as a surprise. Without reconstructing the infrastructures, without increasing hires in academia, increasing budget, loosening individual authority power, the effort to make numerical balance in gender is likely to simply drive to a zero-sum game and no one gets benefit out of it. Um, 
now, uh, yeah, as a, a Frenchman talking uh, here, expect no benefit of curing the symptoms of a defect structure without touching the roots of the problem. Uh, revolution, <laughs> let's <laughs> cut their heads down. Or as my neighbor was uh, saying in uh, a few minutes ago, other parts of their anatomy. <laughs> that was, uh, that's all of that uh, is on the chat uh, today. <laughs> um. Do we have any questions already in the room? Yes. Hi, uh, I had two questions. One for you, Pierre, which is, uh, did you do any qualitative research to find out uh, if it was a, uh, enabling you to find this out? But did you do any qualitative research to understand why it had this effect? And another question for you, uh, Keisa, which is you've given some uh, initiative at the uh, sort of organizational level. Is there anything you could do at the team level or the manager level uh, to change behaviors? And if so, which behaviors would you like to change? Is it, for instance, like monitoring time spoken during meetings, things like this? I'd be really curious to hear. Uh, sadly, I didn't do any qualitative research. Actually, there was someone who suggested a good idea, which was to make uh, the people in the hiring committees take IATs, right, and see whether there was any correlation with uh, you know, gender bias as measured by the IAT and what we saw in the data, but um, that ended up being slightly complicated. That there was one thing that I didn't mention in the talk that I found in the data, which was also quite surprising, and that's been backed up by qualitative research, which is that, um, so I see whether your advisor's in the committee, okay? And um, there's a huge effect, and that effect is twice as strong for men, and you know, statistically different, so it seems, um, um, so, so basically, the effect for, for women in, in my data set of having your advisor in your committee, that's enough to be judged the same as a man with no advisor in the committee. And uh, the effect is twice as strong for men who have an advisor in the committee. So um, th that's something that's been backed up by qualitative research that I see in the, in, in, um, in the data. So to go down from the sort of the higher up organization level into manager, let's say department chair level, it's not that actually big of a leap. You could just think it's the same things, but just on a smaller scale. So depending on like what is the issue that we're trying to solve, there are a number of things. So um, inclusion could start from very small things like how do you run your area meetings? Um, what we have done in our group is that we usually go around the table, we let the juniors go first, we ask, you know, what do you think? Um, it, which is one way of like sort of clearing the table, giving them voice. Um, another sort of simple trick, um, and this is what we stole from the Obama administration, whose cabinet at the time was the most diverse cabinet ever now. Joe Biden's cabinet actually has, you know, uh, become even more diverse. But still, the women in in his cabinet were feeling a little bit frustrated because they were interrupted in meetings, and they weren't getting credit um, for their ideas. So they came up with something that they termed amplification: is that when you would say something in a meeting, somebody would then jump right after you and say, just to get back to, you know, uh, Christine's great point and to build on that. Da da da. And you could do this as a manager. So when you're, you know, running a meeting, like you can sort of hop on the train and, you know, lift everybody um, into and, and give sort of equal credit so that nobody gets left behind. But there are so many things that you can do on that micro level just to change the norms and um, create sort of this um, climate of inclusion. It's actually much harder to do it on the macro level for the whole organization. Yes, uh, so my, uh, it's actually kind of linked to the comment we just heard, and I, I think I didn't, I mean, you will tell me if there are some uh, study on that, but, or, or people try to do this, but the, the fact that w even when you put quotas, which are somehow the rules are given by the top on which candidate they are looking for, so not that surprisingly, they would hire people 
independently of the gender that look like them, which will somehow may not change the, the way the thing is uh, driven. And I'm wondering if some initiative like try to, to have a more bottom-up approach, like what you would expect in your manager to be, so to change the way you will elect the leaders and then, since we know that most of the leaders are males and then the rules should be biased toward their, what is their main uh, advantage, let's say, then you will change the rules and then you will change the way the things are driven. And, and in all what you mentioned, I mean, I, I have the feeling that this is coming to that as a solution, but I don't know if you have example of, like, example of uh, initiative which has been done like that. Like, not the board which is biased himself is telling the rules with quotas, because we know it doesn't work, but trying to, as you said, like, let the employee or the young people, like, say what would be like your mentor, what you would like your mentor to be, what would be the main quality you would expect, and then this would change the game, perhaps. So, um, there's actually a very interesting economics paper that's also very depressing, so I'm sorry I'm going to bring another one <laughs> to the table. That's called Schmoozing and the Old Boys Club. Um, that basically shows um, that uh, female managers promote men and women at equal rates, but that male managers tend to promote men more often, and the paper goes to great lengths to show that it's because um, men are much better at networking with men, you know, so in particular there's lots of uh, funny stuff in the papers, like uh, male employees know the male manager's favorite football teams. Um, there's also an effect if uh, the manager and the employee smoke together. So. I think you're right in pointing out the role of the biased male manager, right? And there's some kind of networking that men seem to be able to leverage uh, much more than women. That could be you know, driving a large part of this bias. Um, did you want to say something, Kaiser? Maybe just to add that I don't think that if we ask the, the junior people on the team or the new hires to um, come up with, you know, what their ideal manager is, that they're any less biased as your average person. So, you know, when we think leader, we think a man, and that applies to men and women, seniors and juniors. Sometimes it can be a little bit context dependent, but normally that is sort of the archetype of a leader that anybody has. So I don't think that really is the solution to the problem. Um, yeah, sorry to, again, add to the depression. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> sort of a uh, related question, but on a very specific point. On the study you presented on the uh, uh, hiring committees, um, uh, Pierre, um, the, you, you mentioned that um, uh, things went worse, and that, uh, as an example, the, the percentage of presi male presidents in the committees did not change. There was no improvement. But did you look at the... Uh, was the worsening true as well when in those committees where women were president? What, what is the influence of this intermediate parameter, which I think is quite interesting? Uh, I'm sorry, just a quick comment. I'm doing my nasty chair, but there are so many questions out there. Can we have for each question just one speaker answering? Although I know that you all would have very valuable input, of course. Yeah, so, so this is uh, kind of linked to the way I interpret the results. Uh, for women, there doesn't seem to be any change in, in their behavior. I mean, for, sorry, for committees with female presidents, um, beforehand, we don't see this positive effect in the treatment group um, if the committees have a female president. Um, I don't know if you remember the, the graph, right? We saw that there was a positive effect for women in the treatment group before the reform, and that was driven by committees with male presidents, and then that becomes strongly negative. And I think there was no effect um, for uh, committees with female presidents in the treatment group before the reform, and there's no effect afterwards. So there it stays constant. Okay, so. Again, my question is very similar to the two first, to the two previous ones, but um, sort of one of the very 
bad news today was about the ineffectiveness or the counter effectiveness of the of the quotas, right? And the question was, can you really generalize from the studies? Or is there any condition by you know for about the jury or anything like this that would make these quotas effective in a in a positive sense? I mean um, is there any potential good news about applying quotas? That's the question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, I think it, it, it depends. Like, what is the, the what, what is the answer that we want? Like, if if you are a female academic and being on a you know hiring committee is good for your CV, so then then a quota is a great thing, right? <laughs> um, but if it doesn't uh, translate to any outcomes for the candidates, then no, that's. Um, that doesn't seem to be, to be doing the trick, but if we just reverse the quota and say it is the quota for the how we construct the applicant pool, then there is evidence that we can actually, you know, get some benefits. So I think the quota is just in the wrong place. So I'm not anti-quota per se. <laughs> just there was a paper that showed that moving from zero women in the hiring committee to one was enough to eliminate a lot of bad behavior. So in, in that case, um, you know, having at least one woman in the room seems to eliminate a lot of bad behavior. That's, uh Uh, yeah, uh, so maybe another context where uh, quota has uh, been shown to, to be effective is like uh, quota in uh, committee programs for conferences. And uh, it has been shown that uh, it uh, uh, prevents from uh, manners, uh, basically, and uh, that uh, more uh, women are invited as uh, keynote speakers in, uh, when there is uh, women in the program committee. So there seems to be something specific to uh, hiring uh, committees, and uh, what is at play? Is it because uh, there is higher stakes? I don't know. Uh, what's your uh, answer on that? <laughs> I think when we were looking at the results, you know, in you know, you have gender quotas in politics, you have gender quotas in in boards, um, and there you do find slightly different results. So I really think um, I really think context matters, and probably how the gender quota is applied also matters quite a bit. Really, what I take away from from my result, it's almost you know, you take the same person, and so you take the you know the committee chair, and if you have more women in the room with him, he becomes more gender biased. Um, so, you know, it's really tough to say, uh, probably there's a version of the gender quota in the, on the members of the committees that works, right? Just we don't know, we don't know how to implement it. So really we need to get down to the nitty gritty of the details of the implementation before. Uh, and really you see results that are all over the place when it comes to owner opposite gender bias, at least in the econ literature. You know, sometimes you find opposite gender bias, you find own gender bias, and I think it's just because the way things are implemented matters really uh, quite a lot. Uh, hello, thank you. So, uh, um, yeah, I was wondering whether, so you talked a lot about uh, intervention from the, uh, for women, or uh, from the women point, uh, from the women's side. But um, what about intervention on gender that, uh, or uh, tackling the issue from the other <laughs> side, which is from the men's side? So, uh, um, are there inf interventions that are helping, for instance, men to uh, to take on uh, jobs uh, that are uh, more f female uh, stereotyped? Um, can this be interesting, actually, to to degender the society? And uh, and also for gender, <laughs> I mean for hiring committees, like uh, more putting interventions on not hiring like uh, maybe not mediocre men, but uh, <laughs> men that are not as excellent as uh, as the other one could be also another way of uh, of thinking about um, yeah gender interventions. 
Um, so I have a partial answer to that, and then I'll let you maybe complete. Um, so I don't know um, the details of experiments that, are, that, that tackle what you said, but, but I do know that, um, so in the work that I, the report that I showed that was done in 2017 on uh, trying to evaluate the different ac actions uh, in, in French administration, um, on this issue of gender diversity in the workplace, uh, there was actually a focus on uh, how to also work on those um, um, on jobs in which men are a minority, and how to how working on the adverts, even simply the way the adverts are written, could attract uh, more men. So, for example, in um, I mean. Uh, nursery, being a nursery teacher, um, I don't know if you call it teacher, but a care, caregiver, um, there, there was shown to be a, a bias in the language where they would say that they're looking for someone caring and uh, emotion, uh, in, in touch with their emotions or things like this. And so there was a lot of work also to, to work on the counter idea of attracting more men to um, to jobs that, that didn't usually attract them. Uh, there's also a lot of work that's um, at the reform and the regulation level that is being done in France on, the, on paternity leaves uh, and on um, um, equilibre des temps uh, between men and women and at home. So there, yeah, there are a lot of things that are being done. Uh, I, I, I can't detail them because I don't know them in that much detail, but there are a lot of actions in that sense. And I think you're right that the focus, I mean, of this whole day, because because of the way it was structured, was a lot of was a lot on women. But I think we should think about that aspect as well, because it's it's a whole other uh, driving force to to reach gender uh, balance. I don't know if you had any other examples in mind, but that was my my take on it. Yeah. Um, so there's this uh, pretty cool paper actually by a job market candidate from from last year called uh, Alexia Delfino. What she was doing, she was manipulating job ads for these uh, pink collar jobs, you know, for these jobs that are mostly uh, occupied by women. And what she showed, that was uh, slightly surprising. So what she did, right, you'd see either a man or a woman once you clicked on the job ad, and you'd have some stats about the gender composition of the occupation. And when that was manipulated, no effect at all on whether a man would actually apply for the job. What did have an effect was saying that the job um, had harsh uh, rating conditions, you know, so that when you said that, you know, 60% of employees were rated as very, very good or had a high performance versus 30%, men were more likely to apply when you said that the uh, sta standards were super high. Um, so, yeah, there. <laughs> Maybe I quickly hitchhike the discussion because we had a lot of previous questions uh, that was concerning actually uh, the female side of it. You mentioned, you know, maternity and showing pictures of your child at the workplace that this had a negative effect. Is there anything like regarding uh, inclusiveness uh, that we can do, anything we can change in the work culture? I mean, but what can we do about, you know, facilitating, for example, the return of moms to the workplace, for example? Um, so yeah, this uh, this idea of uh, oops, I don't think it's working anymore. Uh, yeah. S um, facilitating paternity leave, uh, of course, is one lever, but also um, there's a lot of there's this, this very big randomized control trial that was also done by the Behavioral Insights team working with Indeed, which is a platform for um, a job platform, where again, uh, putting forward flexible working had a massive effect as well on um, not only women, but also uh, in general had a very positive effect. So I think, again, small interventions that um, that change, the, of course, it's not only wording in the case of flexibility, you need to change the culture of the of the whole organization. But I do think that there are ways of um, balancing and attracting, as uh, facilitating the way men uh, react in that environment. And also, I remembered something earlier which was done. I mean, I don't, I don't know the, um, the, the details of the data and how efficient it was, but I do know that there are some initiatives that were done using virtual reality as well. And the mics don't want me to speak, but um, maybe it's a cue that time is running. Uh, yeah, using virtual reality to to show 
um, to put men in the shoes of women and to make them also live the stereotypes that uh, that you might go through um, when you're walking down the street or when you when you're in the workplace, and these interventions of really like putting yourself in the place of someone can also be interesting in terms of um, sens sensibilization. I don't know if they would be as um, backfiring as diversity trainings, but at least there, I know that there are a lot of initiatives that are being uh, worked on in this sense. Um, so, yeah. So, so these aren't actual published scientific results, but uh, there are a number of uh, companies that we partnered with and they've experimented with different kinds of things, so with a grain of salt, nothing peer-reviewed, but seems to be working. And these are inclusion initiatives that actually don't word the inclusion or diversity in them. And, and some of these are fairly simple things. So one way to exclude women, and these are um, non-profits and, and um, private companies that we've worked with, is that the way that we structure um, meetings. So for example, Finland, where I'm from, um, usually nothing gets decided in meetings, where decisions are made is after the meeting when you go to the sauna and you get naked. Well, it can be a problem uh, for some women, even for Finnish women, to do that. So you get excluded from these things. Or is that the, the men assume that you're uncomfortable with, you know, hopping into the lake naked with them. And sometimes they're right. Um, so sort of changing that culture and saying, like, regulating where do we have meetings? Or when do we have meetings? Um, when I was at Harvard, uh, the local daycare center closed at six. So, and our normal meeting time was from five to six. And what happened is that when it was 5.50, you could kind of see like the women in the room, like, you know, getting closer to the door because they had to get out to get their kids. You know, if you're not by six, they call the police. So if you want your kid, you have to go there. So changing the, and this is sort of an easy organizational practice, being clear, like when are meetings held, um, asking your employees, like, is there one hour in the day that is very inconvenient for you. For some people, it's the lunch hour. For some people, it's five to six. Um, the rules in France are a little bit more strict, but in the US, like a lot of these meetings um, are scheduled at times that really puts um, mothers at disadvantage. So I'm looking at the time, unfortunately. Maybe we'll have one last question from the room. I can ask one. <laughs> Go for it, Emmanuel. <laughs> Um, I think you mentioned that mentoring was possibly efficient. I was wondering what kind of mentoring, uh, if we have any idea, because I can see different ways of, of doing it. Uh, is it only for female, by female, or uh, diversity in both sides, or is, is there a specific form of mentoring that has proved as beneficial? All right, so, so what data actually shows that is what works for women best is not mentoring, but sponsoring. But getting a sponsor is really hard. The next best thing is to have a formal mentor and maybe having one of each. So what we know from the studies on mentoring is that for women, having a female mentor is great for sort of psychological safety and support and sort of sharing, you know, a role model and bonding experience. But usually having a female mentor doesn't open you a lot of doors because the networks are much smaller. So it is much more helpful to have a male mentor to do some of this uh, door knocking for you. So if we have a formal um, institutional process, my, my advice would be like assign one of each and don't leave it up to the people to decide, but make it a mandatory requirement with ac ac accountability and a follow-up process. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to ask a very quick question that might, I, I hope, will also give a quick answer. <laughs> we are in electoral period right now, and if you guys were decision makers tomorrow, um, what would be your first one or two steps uh, in order to make a real positive shift? Um, please. Wow. Uh, guys. <laughs> I'll say I'm really glad I'm not a decision maker. Maybe that's one, <laughs> the first one. Um, it's a it's a very tough uh, it's a very tough one because um, because I think that we saw during the, the the day that there are so many different ways and so many small tweaks and it's 
Uh, I don't know if there is one big thing, but what, what I would definitely do, and this, this is already, it's already the case, it's just that maybe I would give it more budget, but um, I, I would really appoint, um, I'm, I'm saying it as if it doesn't exist. It does exist, uh, an entity, a ministry, or a, sub, a secretariat that really does this, their, their main mission. Uh, the only thing that I would change compared to now is give it much more budget, I guess, so that it really uh, goes and does the work. Um, uh, and, and I would appoint many scientists in it because, uh, because we see that um, in addition to the reforms, you really need to go and collect data to really have a good snapshot of what's working, what's not working, and where you need to put more of your efforts. Because one of the issues uh, which, is, which we're struggling with right now is that when you go to a ministry they, and, and you work with them on a given project, you have you have a specific budget and you, t you need to really think very hard of where you're going to invest this budget because it's only this much. Uh, and so knowing, having a great picture of in like a map, a cartography of like, okay, this is where I need to do more is something that, uh, that would be very useful. So bringing more scientists into policy is my main message, I guess. And that would solve the recruitment problem as well. <laughs> So I would like to uh, close the session by thanking once again the speakers for their insights and the still positive outlook that, you know, there's something we can do and maybe scientists even can play a role in that. Thank you very much.